I'm Mark, um, and I am going to talk a little bit about um, an event that we ran. And just to kind of hands up, I'm clearly not a designer, as you'll see from these slides as we go through. Uh, I have no design experience, and um, I'm not an architect either. Um, I am really annoyingly that kind of money guy. Uh, I'm the one who goes out and tries to find people who will pay for stuff to happen. And that's basically what I've done kind of throughout my career over the last sort of, uh, Jesus, 15 years since I started doing bits and pieces. Um, in the last two years, though, I've been working specifically with a project in Derry called uh, Digital Derry. And the, the intent there is really to kind of take the beginnings of a, a digital cluster, I don't particularly like the word, but you understand what I mean, uh, of about, at the time, I think there was about 70, 75 companies who are in that digital or technology space. So everything from film, television, animation, gaming, uh, mobile technology, that sort of space and do something with it. Uh, try to turn it into something that's a little bit uh, bigger, grander, more ambitious, um, and more successful. So over the last two years, we've been working on lots of different projects. We, uh, we look at f ways to get small amounts of funding into early stage projects to, to kind of get them going. Um, we very much look at collaboration about finding ways to bring people together. Uh, but central to, to kind of what the, the aim and ambition is to do is, is also raise the profile uh, of what's happening in the city as well. We have some fantastic companies and um, you know, for I think one thing we can all agree about is that you know, Ireland generally is not very good about you know, talking ourselves up. You know, we're not great about saying, here's something we do fantastically well. And that happens on a, you know, a national scale, it happens on a regional scale, but I think most detrimentally it happens on an individual company scale. You know, nobody wants to be the guy at the front of the room saying, we are fucking great. Uh, where, to be honest, if you go really anywhere else, that's all people want to do, you know, and that's endearing to a point. Um, but you know, it can be, you know, it, it can be a real issue in terms of, of actually getting business done. You know, if people don't know what your skills are and what your capabilities are and, and what you are really world class at, then you know, why would they want to hire you? You know, why would they want to check out your stuff? So putting together events and, and opportunities to showcase the talent that is there um, has really become central to what our what our aims and our objectives are with, with Digital Dairy. Um, and one of the perks, and there are lots of perks of doing what I do, one of the perks is that um, you know, I do get to take a, an element of a design role in this. Um, just to put it in a little bit of context, Digital Dairy now has gone from, like I said, about 70, 75 companies. I think there's about 125 now, two years in, which is cool. Uh, we work with just about every stakeholder. Um, the council, the urban regeneration company, the university, um, you know, any, anybody wants to play, we'll, we'll play with them. You know, we don't, we're not very precious about it. Um, but in terms of practical, tangible setup, I'm, I'm it. Uh, I'm the one guy who gets a salary, everybody else plays for free. Um, so I do get to kind of have a hands-on role in actually designing what we do. And sometimes that is an intelligible process that I actually sit down and work out what happens. Sometimes we just make it up as we go along and then you know, a bit of revisionist history come back and saying, we designed that. Um, uh, but with, with the, the event that we ran at the end of August, it was actually a design process. We had a very specific output that we wanted to achieve. Um, but we also had very specific limitations in terms of time skills, budgets, resources, all of those sort of things. And we took a conscious decision at, at the beginning of it to sit down and say, what can we achieve in this space of time with the resource, resources that we have, and what do we actually need to do with this? Uh, we didn't want to just put on an event for the crack. You know, we're not there specifically to make money, so there wasn't that, that imperative at the beginning of it. Um, so we, we kind of had a bit of a blank page. The other benefit of doing what I do is I get to effectively, at, on the public purse, go around to lots of cool events. Um, this is my personal favorite, uh, South by Southwest. Uh, does anybody familiar with South by? Couple, okay, cool. If you haven't been, uh, I highly recommend it, okay? Um, and I recommend it for one reason. It is affectionately, uh, affectionately known as spring break for geeks, right? And it is. It's a piss up, right? And every year, uh, the Northern Ireland government basically pays, I think we spent about 100 grand last year to uh, support companies going to this piss up. Right? And you know, yes, we do business, of course. Yeah, we, we meet potential customers and clients and you know, there's opportunities to showcase and, and show off what you're doing. But realistically, the reason people want to go is they have a great time, okay? Uh, they go there because it's fun and they get to see lots of things they wouldn't otherwise see. And as you'll see from their little logo, it combines lots of things which are related but don't often cross over in the same events. Right? So you have 
this huge music uh, conference, which uh, conference festival, which runs for a week, attracts something like a hundred thousand paying punters. Right? That's not people turning up just to see what's going on. That's people who've bought a ticket. Um, but it also then has a film festival running through it and attracts the interactive part, which is the digital media technology. That's the bit that we generally go out for. You know, that has 35,000 people at it, at a ticket price of over a grand. Okay? So these people come from all over the planet. They go to this event, and you have to ask why. Yeah? So when we started kind of thinking, well, we want to do an event, and we have certain outputs and things that we want to do, you know, obviously my mind immediately went to this and say, well, this is kind of best of breed. This is something that does what nobody else really gets right. Yeah? And that really was the beginning of, of the process of, of putting together the event that we did. Um, and when I first went here, I, I actually went out in 2008 and 2009, skipped a year in 2010, and then 2011 was the first kind of official capacity where I went out. Previously, it was just a piss up, and, and now I had an official reason to go on a piss up. Um, and in 2011, we started to kind of look at this and dissect it a little bit. So at that point, we started saying, OK, we want to do an event. We want to showcase what's going on in Derry. We want to highlight the companies and, and bring people and attract people to the city. We should start planning this. But we also had you know, other events and, and things that we've been to as well that we wanted to incorporate. But also, there was this, this crux at the beginning that said we needed to make this about what our objectives were for the organization as opposed to just let's put on a great event. If you had a blank sheet of paper and said design an event, then you can do whatever you like. But we had specific outputs that we needed to see. We also were, were aware of other events that we've been to which had parts that we liked the look of. So the basic question is you start putting all these pieces together, what does that overall design look like? What does that overall event look like? And then there were limitations. And potential. Some of you may be aware that next year Derry is the UK City of Culture uh, for 2013. So what that means is a year-long program event. I think there's 184 uh, events, festivals, activities that are taking place over the course of the year. Uh, the big one being the All Ireland Fla, that'll be 400 odd thousand people descending on uh, a, a city with a hundred thousand population. Yeah. So there's a real opportunity there. So we were sitting in, in March, April of 2011 saying Okay, by 2013, we got to come up with something that's really cool that's going to allow us to tap into this year-long festivities um, and really use that as a springboard or a platform to show off what we were doing. So that's really the kind of context. Right? We wanted to create an event that showcased what, what was happening. We liked some of these things here and saw that there were elements of them that worked extremely well. And we had a deadline. Right? And that really are the, those are the kind of key pieces that informed the design process that goes into the festival. So we decided, effectively, if we were going to do something in 2013, it would make sense to have some clue how it ran or operated. I've done lots of conferences and one-day workshops and things like that, but I've never put on anything at any sort of scale. Um, you know, I think the biggest event we'd ever done previously had about 300, 350 people at it, and we were just about comfortable with that. And so to put on something that was monumentally larger and much more complicated, we figured that we needed to at least build you know, a rough and ready version of that uh, to begin with, hence doing an event in this year. So again, there was a very specific process that we went through, and this is it. The first thing we knew we needed to do is, is create a rough sketch effectively. You know, so I have an idea for a lampshade, I'll draw the lampshade, and you know, that's my rough sketch. And for me, in that rough sketch, effectively what you're doing is, is what's the DNA of it? You know, what makes it this thing that's in your head? What makes it unique and different than the other lampshades and the other lampshades? And that, I think, in a lot of ways, you can put down on paper really, really quickly. Um, the next thing is, is we knew that there were elements that we were unsure about. You know, could, we, could we do it? Uh, could we pay for it? All of these things. And you know, we made deliberate, specific decisions to test particular elements which we thought were central to the success in 2013. So if we're going to do something in 2013, this is what we need to figure out can or can we not do in 2012. The actual designing of the, of the event itself was effectively putting one and two together. You know, so here's the, the DNA in the big picture, and here's the specifics that we want to test and play around with. And then you kind of go into the shampoo bottle version, which I use a lot. Uh, lather, which was hype it up, get lots of things happening, do the event. And then rinse, repeat was basically get rid of all the, 
the guff and the sales pitch, look at what actually worked and what didn't work, what broke and what stayed, um, and then effectively ask yourself, do we repeat? You know, do we do the same thing again, or do we start, start from scratch and try to do something different? And you know, with a prototype, you might ideally you want to go through lots of iterations before you come up with the, the final product. We didn't unfortunately have that luxury. We had two bites of the cherry. We have 2012 and then the main event in 2013. So we had to really test a lot of this stuff to destruction. And it's kind of an odd situation to be in where you are deliberately planning an event to fail in certain areas. Yeah? Um, you know, I, I'll talk a bit more about it in a second, but we were deliberately planning that some things had to break. Right? And if nothing broke, then we would have no idea whether or not it would break at a higher scale. It's like this kind of, you know, when they test objects and so on, and they bash it with a machine for like 10,000 times, and on the 10,001st, it actually falls apart. Right? That's, that's where we, we needed to get to. We needed to break some of the stuff so that we knew what the tolerance levels were. Right? If we were going to do something that had X thousand people at it, um, you know, we needed to know if it worked at that scale before we started trying to have 10x thousand people at it. Um, so just to kind of step through those in a little bit more detail, again, the rough sketch for me is the DNA. You know, what can't you get rid of? You know, what's, when you take everything away and you simplify to the absolute essence of something, um, you know, what makes that different than the next thing? Okay? You can brand, you can do all sorts of things, but for me, a lot of that is, is sheen, that surface. Right? What can't you get rid of? And for us, these were the things we pulled out. Okay? We absolutely wanted to create an event that blended the arts and cultural space with technology. That was the focus of the event. Okay? Um, the reasons for that, again, kind of come out of, of what we've been doing as, as, a, as an organization, so to speak, over the last few years. Those are the kind of companies that we're producing. You know, we're producing companies in, in music technology, film and television, um, you know, um, gaming, those sort of companies are coming through. So we wanted to make sure that we were, we were creating an event and a festival that spoke to that. Right? There was no point in creating something about you know, um, business to business software because we're not doing that. Okay? That's not what we wanted to promote. So we needed to create something that, that spoke to, to us. The open access model is something that we very much took from things like South by Southwest. Um, it's really interesting, but the guys at South by charge, you know, a thousand pounds a ticket, knowing full well that 80, 90 percent of what people are coming from, they're not creating, which is a kind of odd model if you think about it. Um, the, you know, again, another example would be something like the Edinburgh Festivals. Uh, I, I know the director of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival reasonably well. And you know, the one thing that struck me from the outset was they don't program anything. They don't book a comedian. They don't you know, book any music. They don't do anything. You know? They do the marketing and they deal with infrastructure and the, you know, they make sure that the, the buses are getting people where they need to go to. But all the program comes from other people. But the organization and the festival still exists. The Edinburgh Festival is the largest festival on the planet and they don't book a single act. Huh? Great work if you can get it. Yeah? And that's effectively what we wanted to do. We wanted to make sure that you know, people are going to come from all the other stuff and keep our element of the programming fairly tight. The other festivals that I enjoyed, and not just South by Southwest, or not just Liverpool Sound City, but they all were very much rooted in a place. You, know, you couldn't have taken them somewhere else. Right? They were about this city, or this venue, or whatever it is. And I think that is, that is essential in an event, that it's not just about we have this bunch of people in a room. I mean, who's been to a conference in a nameless hotel in a city you can hardly remember? Yeah? And I think that really is, is something missing. You know, I think that's an, an opportunity lost when most events are designed. Because effectively, you go for the easy option, you go to the hotel, they have all the AV equipment, they've got all the rooms, they can do the catering for you, and, and it's a square box. Yeah? And, and you kind of go in and you say, right, this looks an awful lot like the conference I was at before. And that was certainly not the case with things like South by or, or Liverpool Sound City. They were about the city. You know, they were about getting out and exploring and going to weird and wonderful venues that you might never have stepped, stepped foot in before. We also wanted to make sure it was a festival, not just a conference. We wanted to make sure that it wasn't just about sitting and listening to, to people talking. And we wanted people to go and explore and, and experiment and experience. We wanted to make sure it was fun. Uh, and we also wanted to focus, as I say there, the thing. And what I mean by that is that other conferences and events focus on the business of the thing. Right? So I have this great startup idea, how do I get it funded? That's the business of the thing. We wanted to focus on the thing. 
You know, what should I create? What's, what's the big idea? You know, um, the craft and, and the enjoyment of, of building something new rather than, you know, am I going to get backed by a VC? So we wanted, that was kind of the DNA of our event. And that was reflected in some very specific choices. Um, the program and the people, we very specifically made sure that the program was pretty much an even split between the tech and, and, the, um, and the arts and cultural. And we made sure that we picked as many people as we could who crossed over. So instead of going out and trying to get the CEO of the latest web startup, we actually went out and got the director of the Barbican in London. Right? And he came and talked about what they were doing with digital technology. So you automatically kind of appealed to both camps. And we wanted to make sure that the people that we were going and marketing to came from those camps as well. The open access model, we wanted lots and lots of partners. So we deliberately decided to go out and ask lots of people to get involved. Um, everything, I don't know if anybody who's been to Derry, it's quite easy to segment it because there's a set of walls. And you put everything in the walls, and it's, it's fairly compact. Um, the festival, not just a conference, so there was gaming events. There was 50 music acts. There were digital arts installation. Fun, we plied people with booze quite shamelessly, um, you know, wherever possible. Uh, we had lots of parties, we did silly things, you know, we, it wasn't necessarily very serious. And again, the focus was on the thing, and again, that was more about what it wasn't. It wasn't about talking about the business elements. We also needed to test assumptions, um, you know, and um, that's, that's the line, you know, if you assume you make an ass out of you and me, there's something like it. Yeah, okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> so the assumptions that we had to test, these are the things that we fundamentally thought would be required if we were going to have a success in 2013. First of all, we were assuming people would give a shit. You know? If nobody turns up, you haven't got much of a festival. Uh, so we were assuming people would come. We were assuming that we could pay for it. Um, and you know, we don't have deep pockets. Um, you know, and we, we didn't want to charge an awful lot of money. We wanted to make it very accessible. Um, so we had to effectively depend on our ability to sell the idea to funders and sponsors. Um, that we could manage logistically, again, me, um, I should have, you know, we've got lots of people who help out, we've got lots of volunteers, but volunteers have their day jobs. So unfortunately, we only had one person that could actually do the, the specifics um, of actually delivering it. The speakers were come, um, you know, you need good people, you need good content, and you know, for us it was about where can we find the best content and can we convince them to come because we weren't paying them. Um, so they had to come spend some time in Derry for free. In some cases they were coming from you know, North America, which means they were taking a week or two out to come and spend 15 minutes talking to a bunch of people in Derry. Um, and the structure and format, you know, would we get the balance right? For me that was very much about load balancing. You know, make sure that you know, all of the events and everything that we tried to put on all had a reasonable audience. You know, there's obviously going to be some things that are more popular than others, but we did, wanted to make sure that nobody was presenting in front of an empty room. And again, specific decisions that we made, well they were more about you know, what's, what's the pass fail? You know, how do we judge whether or not this was successful? We decided for the conference element we wanted at least 600 delegates. Right. That was a reasonable number, uh, which was bigger than anything we'd done before, that um, you know, financially justified the conference pieces, and we wanted eight to 10,000 punters across the wider festival elements. Uh, we set a break-even target of 145,000 pounds, that was gonna cost. Um, that may seem quite big for a first off. Um, it's a deliberate decision in a way to say, there's no point in doing something half arse that's not gonna give us a proper test. We needed to do something that was at least a semblance of what we wa ended up wanting to deliver. Again, we worked back. We knew that doing what we wanted to do in 2013 was gonna cost us four or 500,000 um, pounds. We knew we needed to work back from that. So that seemed reasonable for the first year. The logistics would be kept internally, that we would specifically te uh, go and target speakers from outside of Northern Ireland. And again, that you know, the popularity and attendance at various events would be reasonably well balanced. Right? Again, it was a very deliberate decision to test these things to breaking point. We needed some of these things to fail, and, and that comes back to you know, anybody who pulled a uh, apart DVD players or clocks as a kid or whatever you do. You only figure out how something works by breaking it in the first place. You know? um, the people who know most about brains are the people who go and study people with brain injuries or brain diseases because they see what's abnormal, what's wrong, and then they work back from there and say, right, how do we get that right? So we deliberately wanted some of these things, you know, on these two slides, to fail. We wanted some things not to work. Um, so you know, we, we pushed them. Um, and then we went and did it. Um, just to kind of put in a little bit of context, uh, it ran for four days. We had 94 
speakers. Um, roughly speaking, we had, what do we have, 850 conference delegates. Uh, about 5,000 people went through the actual formal parts of the festival and the total footfall through the festival events, so we had a couple of free concerts and stuff, was in excess of 15,000. Um, I'll go through some of the specific numbers because I like sharing. Uh, but as you can see, we did a lot of different stuff. We had gaming, um, you know, we got quite a lot of media coverage. I think advertising value equivalent of about 150K. Uh, we had DJs playing gigs, we had um, speaker sessions, we had concerts. We, we just, again, just tried everything. You know, throw it all against the wall and see what sticks. Um, and it was very much about trying to test that DNA and test those sort of assumptions. And it happened. And it nearly killed me, but it happened. <laughs> so then the rinsing part starts. All right? And say, okay, well, listen, we lathered up, we talked about it, we hyped it, we talked about it in glowing terms, we told everybody it was going to be fantastic. If you don't do that, nobody's going to come. But then we have to take a step back and say, well, what worked and what didn't? Okay? Um, I just fired that out as, a, as a, an image, but then when I think about it, it actually is fairly represent, representative in terms of the feedback we got. We spent a, sent a lot of surveys out. We asked a lot of people just to you know, tell us what worked, tell us what didn't. We knew some of the things internally already, um, but you know, kind of going out and asking people's opinion is really important pro part of that design process. Because again, I can see things which I would change, and I can see things which I thought worked extremely well. But when I speak to the punters, the people who are actually using it, they're telling me something slightly different. Sometimes it's nuanced, sometimes it's fundamental, um, and this is what we found out. Um, again, you know, assumptions, would people come? Yes, people came. All right. uh, we sold it reasonably well. However, the way that we priced it was a definite issue. We priced it inexpensively. I think it was like 50 quid for a go-everywhere ticket, you know? which sounds great. But unfortunately, it kind of fell in a dead zone. You know, it wasn't enough that we really made any money off it, um, but it wasn't cheap enough that everybody would go. So, that needs fixed. It didn't quite work. We didn't generate as much revenue from ticket sales as we expected to. We also missed huge audiences that we never even thought about. We had flawed assumptions about who we were actually making this thing for. We kind of assumed it would be like the other events and festivals we went to where you were essentially selling to an industry audience. Whereas in fact, out of 15 odd thousand people, I reckon no more than about 600 came from the industry. And we specifically missed big chunks of people that we'd not even thought about. People like kids. Yeah? I'd always kind of just thought that kids were just miniature adults and they popped up and, you know, I haven't gotten any. Yeah? Uh, and, you know, they don't even enter into my thinking. Yeah? But then when you start to look at it, and we had, in the particularly in the last kind of week or two before the event, we had parents specifically phoning up and sending us emails saying, can I bring my kids along? They'd absolutely love this. Right? And in the end, we ended up giving away a couple of hundred free tickets to kids. And by a country mile, those were the coolest bits that we did. Yeah? And then I started asking a question is, well, why did we never think of that before? And the answer that I came up with is, there are no uh, conferences and festivals for kids in this space. They don't exist. Right? So there's a huge market that we never even thought about. But if we hadn't had a go at it, we never would have figured that piece out. We just would have run a conference next year, funnily enough, the kids program might be the biggest thing that we do within the festival. Right? For no other reason than they're the ones who really love it. Right? They're the ones who love getting hands on with games. We had a 3D printing thing. You should have seen the kids playing with that. It was nuts. Right? And, and all ages. I think the youngest people we had there were three or four years old. Um, obviously, most of you hopefully would be familiar with something like Coder Dojo. That, you know, we, we ran a Coder Dojo session, which was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. We want to do 10 times as much. Funder sponsors, would they bite? We set a target of 145K. We ended up taking about 195 in revenues, um, which was fine. Uh, about two thirds of that was new money, so we removed things from other sponsorship deals and stuff we had in place. But what it told us is in a fairly short amount of time, we could raise an awful lot of uh, cash, at least enough to pay to do it, right? um, which makes our target of about half a million in sponsorship revenue for, for 2013 seem reasonable. We did this in about four or five months, um, you know, so. Given 12 months, I think we should be able to double it through. Could we manage logistically? Hell no. All right. That was, that was the, an absolutely flawed assumption. Um, you know, and it goes specifically to thinking that you can do a bit of everything. 
and looking and saying, okay, well, that music gig, Jesus, that's, that's simple enough. You book the act, you, you, you put up some posters and people just turn up. <laughs> Funnily enough, it doesn't work like that. Um, there were specific areas of expertise that we simply didn't have. Right? And that has led to some very simple decisions about partnering and collaboration and, and hiring in expertise and talent for next year's version. Um, speakers would come, yet yeah, we deliberately targeted speakers from outside of Northern Ireland. So about 90% of our 90 speakers came from outside of Northern Ireland, which was great. Uh, it proved the point that people would come, you know, sold on that idea. Um, but again, the feedback from, from people who actually came is they weren't that fussed about where they, the speakers came from. There was a certain you know, cachet in saying we've got X number of speakers coming from San Francisco and Berlin and you know, Madrid and all of these things. That was kind of cool. And it sold it to the sponsors and some of the, you know, the, the, um, the, the public organizations that got involved, but really didn't make that much of a difference to our audience. Uh, and the structure and format, yes, but there were things that, that didn't work. Our keynote sessions didn't really work. You know, we didn't have the numbers in there that we thought the speakers you know, should have attracted. And that was structural more than um, anything to do with the quality of the content. You know, we put them on at the wrong time, we put them in rooms that were too big, um, we put them on clashing with other events and so on. But one thing that did come out is the, the um, more intimate pieces, the experiential pieces, the things that were in small sessions, deliberately so, worked very much better and were very much more positively received. Um, and in terms of the actual DNA, the, the, the core of it, what we want to do more of, the open access model worked. We had 30 odd partner organizations which is cool, uh, we want to have 60, 70. Um, in fact, we will increasingly move towards that Edinburgh Festival model where we take care of things like marketing, ticketing, uh, infrastructure, but everybody else comes and delivers the content. Um, so, you know, as a standing invitation, if anybody, you know, is looking for an opportunity or a platform to come and do something, throw a party, run a workshop, um, have some design dialogues, great, we're open for business, please come along. The deal is going to be pretty simple. You know, we're, we're going to take care of the costs. We're going to take care of getting the venues, providing the AV, and other people come and fill in the content. And making it a festival, not just a conference, again, that worked very well. The things that people could experience and play with um, were the highlights. And I think you know, combining the two there, a little bit of a you know, dig in the gut, but the best things were the bits that we didn't do. Um, but that's cool. Uh, you know, the, the people who just were able to focus on one thing and you do that really, really well, those were the highlights of the event. And the things that we were trying to do a little bit too much of, those are the things that failed. Uh, and it was fun. Everybody seemed to have a laugh. Um, the booze went down well. You know, drinks were had. People enjoyed themselves. Nobody died. Pretty cool. Things that worked OK um, that we're probably going to leave kind of as is, Doing it within the city center did work very well. We used about 12, 13 venues across the city. We didn't push that as far as I think we could have. Uh, we'd initially talked about using lots of you know, empty retail spaces and so on. And you know, I think there's something in that, but logistically it was a bloody nightmare. And um, spe specifically because using those kind of pop-up spaces, you don't really know if you have access to them until literally a few weeks before. Because obviously the landlord's always going, saying, oh, we're gonna rent it next month and it's been sitting there for two years and you're trying to talk them into it, but they won't take it and let, give it to you until they're certain they're not giving it to anybody else. So there's a little bit more we need to do about getting that in, but roughly speaking, that worked and the blend was about right. Woo -hoo. Let's go to that. Um, and what do we need to fix? The focus on the thing, we, we probably were a little bit too anal about that. Um, you know, there was, there was a real kind of feeling that people wanted a bit more. And they came and they heard about a fantastic, exciting project uh, from a really great speaker. And it was very TED style, and this was deliberate. We, we specifically said to the speakers, everybody familiar with TED? Talks? Okay. We deliberately said to the speakers, make it a bit like that. We gave them 15 to 20 minutes on average, um, and people wanted more. They just wanted more depth. They wanted to talk through a little bit more. They wanted, and that, again, was, a, was an assumption that we made in terms of how this thing looks, which I don't think is wrong. But I think, we, again, we were a bit too anal about it. We didn't need to stick to that format for every speaker. Some people really did need an hour or you know, a half hour conversation or something like that. So playing around with the model a little bit more. So that's kind of the rinse period. We know what we got out of it. We know what's gonna change in the event going forward. And we tested some of our assumptions to breaking point. The things that broke, we need to fix. 
Um, we can't manage the logistics of this. We couldn't manage it with the numbers we had. How the hell would we manage it with two or three times as many? So one of the things that happens is the budget goes up, we hire more people, and we hand over delivery of key elements to professionals who know what they're doing. We're not doing a single music event next year. There will be lots of music events. We're not doing any of them. All right? We're underwriting the music events, basically saying, you won't lose money, come and do it. And we're going out to nightclub promoters and festival organizers and say, you guys are the experts, you do it. Okay? Uh, I never want to organize another music event in my life. Uh, uh, literally, our kind of headline DJs pull, n n more or less pulled out five minutes before we were meant to start. Uh, I had a slight heart attack, and you know, it was nuts. We're never doing that again. But through that rinsing process, we've now got to the stage where we go, OK, cool. Do we repeat? The answer to that hopefully is, is yes. Uh, we're still, I think we're 95% there. Um, you know, again. The one big question is, you know, can we pay for it? And, and that's always going to be the question. So we've kind of been shopping it around for the last month or so as we've pulled in uh, our detail. Uh, we're pretty confident we should announce, uh, uh, you know, first of all, that we're doing it. And secondly, our first major uh, sponsorship partnership uh, within the next week or two. So once we do that, hopefully by the end of this month, then it'll be on again. And then, you know, using the process that we went through, and learning what we did from it is to go out and find as many partners as we can possibly find to work with. That, in my head, that open access model is something really different. And, and it looks, in fact, you know, if you, if you look at um, this whole kind of week long, of, sorry, I don't know, two weeks Innovation Dublin kind of runs, that's kind of how that works. Uh, and we just want to condense that into four days and kind of make it a little bit manic and, and you know, fun. Um, and, like I said, we're open for business. We're always looking to collaborate. Uh, we're always looking for interesting stuff that can happen. And you can get me at Culture Tech Fest on Twitter or info at culturetech.co, not .co.uk or com, just co. We actually had leaflets sent back to us because they thought that it had been misprinted. Uh, <laughs> .co, it's the new trendy version. Um, and that's it. Guys, thanks very much.